good evening from Wolfville and Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Where over the last four days, we have been privy to a number of activities, discussions, and events in honor of Reconciliation Day, Treaty Day, and today the Sisters in Spirit event, bringing attention to the fact that we still see a tremendous number of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. We have much work ahead of us. October is Mi'kmaq History Month as well, so please take some time this month and every month and every day to listen, to learn, and to unlearn. My name is Una Proudfoot, and I'm the Executive Director of Alumni Affairs in the Office of Advancement at Acadia. And it's my pleasure to celebrate National Coaches Day this fine evening and to welcome our esteemed guests, Mark Smith of Falmouth, Nova Scotia, who retired recently as head coach of Canada's bronze medal winning women's softball team after a historic run at the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. Volunteer coach and educator and good friend of mine, James Weeks, and head coach of the Acadia women's volleyball team, mentor and educator, Michelle Wood. I'll provide you with more of a bio on each of our panelists in just a moment. Before we get started, though, just a few housekeeping items, if I may. I'll ask you all now to please uh, produce your proof of vaccine. Just kidding. Uh, we will ask you to mute all of your microphones during the presentation, um, and the presentation will be a conversation with the three panelists and, and me as the moderator. Um, so mute your microphones if you are not posing a question. If you'd like to ask a question of one of our guests, by all means, the easiest way would be to raise your virtual hand, and then I can call upon you. If you're not comfortable asking uh, your question out loud, by all means, you are absolutely invited to launch your chat function and type the question in the chat function of the uh, session this evening. So National Coaches Day uh, was identified uh, in 1972 by President Richard Nixon in the U.S. Um, he signed a proclamation for National Coaches Day and stating that coaches are highly qualified teachers in highly specialized fields, but more than that, they are friends and counselors still in their players' important attitudes that will serve them all of their lives and in all parts of their lives. In Canada followed suit shortly afterwards. So in honor of National Coaches Day, we invited three panelists to join us this evening. So Mark is a three-time world champion, a six-time Pan American Games medalist, a 2020 Olympic Games medalist, as, and was the 2016 recipient of the Jack Donahue Coach of the Year Award. He is a former high performance director, head coach of Softball Canada's Olympic Women's National Team Program, and is currently director of sport for Sport Nova Scotia. He's a member of the International Softball Congress Hall of Fame and the Canadian Softball Hall of Fame and the Nova Scotia Sport Heritage Hall of Fame. Welcome, Mark. James is a coach and educator, originally from Plymouth, England. James is currently the head of school at the Booker School in Port Williams, Nova Scotia. He has been working and coaching in international schools since 2008 and has taught in Germany, Barbados, Thailand, and Canada. James has coached school sports from U8 soccer and basketball to the varsity teams and has also coached adult men's basketball in Barbados. Within school settings, James has volunteered to coach students in public speaking skills and Lego robotics. As an international baccalaureate workshop leader, James travels to different schools to teach teachers how to facilitate the primary years program. Welcome, James. In her 10th season as a head coach of the Acadia Axe women volleyball team, Michelle brings a wealth of experience as a player, mentor, educator, and coach. In the summer of 2017, she was an assistant coach with the FISU women's volleyball Team Canada in Taipei, China. Michelle first began her stint with national team programs in 2015 when she assisted Canada to a sixth place finish at the World University Games in South Korea. She was honored as the recipient of the 2018 Women Active Nova Scotia Leadership Trendsetter for her work in advancing women in sport and was named the Atlantic University Sport Volleyball Coach of the Year in 2017-18 and 2019-20. She is currently the director of Acadia Sports Camps, which provides sports-specific and adventure camp programming to youth within the Annapolis Valley. Welcome to all three of our guests this evening, and thank you so much for sharing your time with us. I think everyone on the line who is uh, attending this evening, virtu this evening virtually would agree with me that we have, quite, all of you combined, have quite a, a number of years and experiences in the coaching um, arena. So, how this is going to work this evening, um, I'm going to ask each of you to share with us uh, a little bit about outside of the bio that I just shared with our with our guests, a little bit about 
who you are and how you landed where you are now. Um, what drew you to where you are now, but also sort of through your other experiences. Um, please, you know, feel, feel free to share with us whatever it is you'd like to at this point in time. And then we're gonna open up to some questions. We had some attendees uh, submit the questions previous. So I'll, I'll work through those while at the same time, as I say, keeping an eye on the chat function for um, questions from our guests who are here this evening. So I'm going to begin with Michelle. I did your bio third, so I'm going to start with you first. And as I say, just give us a little bit of a, a background. Tell us who you are. Tell us why you are where you are. Um, any other gems that you'd like to bring to light at the beginning of the conversation? Yeah, th thanks for having me, Una. And i um, really happy to be here amongst James and Mark to have this conversation around sport and coaching and, and all that we, we love to do and we're passionate about. Uh, so I grew up in Toronto, and um, I guess what, what drew me to sport initially was my older brother. I'm, I'm a middle child, and my brother and I were like twins, and whatever he did, I needed to do, and I needed to do better. And I always aspired to be whatever he was doing, and even to the point when he started joining um, cadets in the military, that was I was going to do that with him. So we started with baseball very young, and as I was sharing with Mark, and baseball was my uh, primary sport, and somehow someone lured me into volleyball. And for those of you that know me, I'm 5'6", so it's just, it's not the natural sport to lure a 5'6 athlete into, and so sometimes I think if I could go back, would I choose another sport? And, and if I could, I probably would have been a soccer player. I think I, I didn't really play very much competitive soccer growing up, but I love to run. I, I love working in a team environment and I love being outdoors. So when I had a chance to play soccer, that was one of my favorite sports to play. So I, I started coaching uh, and I started uh, getting into coaching because of the people around me, because of the mentors that I had. And I know 100% I would not be where I am today if I did not have the people guiding me along this path. And it's not because it was their passion. It was because they saw how excited I got when I was in that environment and they helped foster that and create a pathway for me to be able to do what I love when there were probably moments of major self-doubt of wondering whether I was capable or competent enough at the age that I was, whether or not I could do this. And so coaching for me started quite young. I was still in university when I was named the head coach of the Ontario uh, provincial team programs. And I did that for two years before I was named the head coach of the Canada games program for Ontario. And at that time I was, I had just graduated university and I was kind of in a, you know, where do I go within my life and in my career? And I wanted to be a teacher. I did education. That was something that I was really interested in. And I was hired with the Toronto District School Board at the exact same time as I was hired at Acadia. And that was really inter a really interesting decision for me, a job that would keep me close to my family or a job that would allow me to educate and teach and be in a world where people are trying to celebrate and, and strive for their passion so in a sense, the coaching is, it's a non-traditional education platform. And I thought I would rather be with individuals who love doing what they're doing than individuals who are forced to do what they have to do in the school system. And that led me out to Acadia. But at, at the time, the really interesting part of it, the position at Acadia, and not many positions open up at, you know, at any given time within university sport, but there were six athletes on the Acadia roster at the time that I had coached with the provincial team X amount of years earlier. So it was just a really, really interesting fit uh, that when I walked into the room that that's kind of, you know, the people in the room were very welcoming and, and familiar faces. And, and Acadia, you know, a lot of people ask me downtown Toronto versus the Acadia Wolfville community. It's very different in, in terms of the lifestyle and this is what I love. I love cycling. I love running. I love going snowshoeing. So this environment really, really speaks to me. And being in university sport, especially at Acadia, I'll say my student athletes are awesome. They're so intelligent, um, very cerebral individuals, very involved in their communities. And I think it makes it a little bit more meaningful when you have something like that, you know, surrounding your town. So yeah, that's a little bit about me. Terrific. Thank you, Michelle, so much for sharing with us. Really appreciate the uh, the brother aspect right at the beginning and your competitiveness right right out of the out of the gates with your brother. Uh, James, we'll go to you next. Thank you, Una. Um, it's a real honor to be here with Mark and Michelle tonight. Um, 
I suspect many of the guests here have heard their names before, but have never heard of me. So it feels, it feels good to be here. Um, I graduated from the University of Plymouth in 2008, and it was a recession and didn't really know what to do with my life at that point. The woman I met at the time, Natalie, who's now my wife and works at Acadia, um, her, she had grown up in Bonn International School in Germany and her family invited us to come live with them for a bit and try and find work at the school. I became a teaching assistant firstly and then the athletics director got hold of me and found out that I was interested in football, but, uh, soccer and basketball and wrote me into coaching. And it didn't take much because I love the sport so much to try my hand at coaching. It was, it was a real easy decision. So my first team that I coached was under 14s girls basketball and their tenacity and their uh, teachability was so incredible that that really sort of glued me in. Um, so after that, I coached both soccer and basketball to all sorts of age groups while, while in Germany. Um, going up to varsity and taking them to the finals in Europe where we're traveling between the different European cities. And then after three years there, my wife and I moved to Barbados where I was again involved in coaching with the school, but also had a chance to work with um, a men's basketball team in Barbados. So that was a real interesting experience. And I think I found out that I actually love coaching adults as well as youth. Um, so I really, I found the, the blend of being an educator and a coach so simultaneous. And what drives me is the effect that you can have on individuals and the legacy that you can leave with them. And those lessons that you, work, that you learn with them can last with them for a long time. Um, I've always been a team sports person. I have started enjoying running and things like that for myself but I love working with teams building up individuals building up a an atmosphere of support and resilience and pushing each other to reach the next level and that's why I love being a coach and an educator. Terrific thank you James um your audio is perfect your video is a little in and out so if you want to try to uh camera off and turn it back on that might work i've been told that works i absolutely have no idea if it actually does um and just to say thank you for that that introduction james and and to acknowledge that um in putting together this panel my intention was to have a diversity of coaches and so um you know a varsity coach a national coach and then a volunteer coach um you know our, our children our youth um and even you know ages beyond uh, benefit from programs in communities that are often led by volunteer coaches, an integral part of the community. So very much a part of this conversation and thank you for joining us. Thank you. And that's our segue into Mark Smith. Mark, over to you. Well, it would have been a long time ago that I ventured into sport, but um, sort of fathering, following in my father's footsteps, he was baseball, softball, hockey, and uh, I very much enjoyed those sports. Softball, probably around the age of my mid-teens, became the sport that I was most attracted to playing and had a very good network of people through my dad to learn from. So that became my interest and my motivation. And uh, by the time I was early 20s, I was traveling the world and living in other parts of the world and, and um, competing for major championships and learning what it took to be world-class and, and to be able to compete against the best in the world. And that was a great opportunity in terms of not only learning the skills associated with my sport, but learning to be around people who are role models and leaders and, and develop some of those skills that I would like to think that eventually I started to, to use myself. Um, about 20 odd years ago, I decided it was time to stop playing the game, but I knew I wanted to stay connected to it, had volunteered and coached minor basketball at the community level and soccer at the community level, but softball was my, my primary sport. And um, at, just shortly after the time I left the national team as a player, I was invited back to participate in a couple of selection camps as a guest coach. And it only took one camp for me to realize that that's where I would like to spend 
uh, as much time as I could. So I got my NCCP certification and I continued to progress through the ranks and was eventually uh, hired by the national team, first as an assistant coach, eventually became a head coach and have spent the last 25 years in various head coach capacities from our junior men's team through to our senior men's team and eventually to our women's Olympic team. So, um, you know, it's fair to say that sport, softball in particular, has been a passion and it's been something that I've I thoroughly enjoyed. I'm a firm believer in giving back, especially to those things that have have uh, treated you well. And so I view coaching as an experience where I'm able to not only impart softball skills, but impart life skills that hopefully develop people as opposed to athletes. Um, I've often told the athletes I coach that as coaches, we're in the people development business. And if I can help you become a better person um, by virtue of the experiences and exposures we have, so that you in turn can go back and give to your community when the time comes, then I feel as though I've made the contribution I've hoped to make. So sports has been a big part of my life for longer than I can remember. And uh, coaching has been something that has just been a natural, um, it was a natural addition to uh, my conclusion as an athlete. And, uh, and I thoroughly enjoyed uh, my time in it. Thank you, Mark, for that uh, overview. I'm, I'm going to start with a first question based on, on something you just said, um, and that's about life skills uh, that get developed um, through coaching and through, your, through one's experience with sport. Talk to us a little bit about what some of those life skills are, what they look like, and how those are developed in a, in a sport program. Well, I've often told people, Una, that everything that I've accomplished in my life to this very second, I owe to sport. Um, sport teaches you how to cooperate. It teaches you how to uh, become resilient. It teaches you how to become creative and innovative. It teaches you the sometimes the hard lessons through defeat, as well as it teaches you uh, what it's like to be successful and, and when you know you've put the time in and you've achieved whatever the particular goal is. So to me, being on a team in, in, in sport is no different than being on a team in the workplace, no different than being on a team at home. It's about cooperation, collaboration, knowing when to lead, knowing when to follow, um, always being mindful that there are things to be learned from other people if you're open to learning. And um, having worked in, in corrections for a number of years with young offenders, male young offenders, one of the things that, that stuck out to me so profoundly was most of these young men that had wound up in conflict with the law had never played sport. And when we would get them out on the field or in the gymnasium and do things with them in a sport context, the, the fighting and the arguing and the disagreements that would happen almost immediately when somebody failed at something they were trying to do. And it gave us an opportunity to help them learn why cooperation and collaboration is important. And so it certainly resonated with me how important the role sport played in my life because you just learn so many things about yourself and others through that experience. And, uh, you know, I'm a firm believer that every child should have an opportunity to experience sport in some capacity, not necessarily to, because they need to aspire to become, you know, professional or collegiate or any other level other than the sheer enjoyment of physical activity, being around other people and learning the collaborative skills associated with being part of a team. Absolutely. I'm, I'm frantically nodding in affirmation with everything that you're saying, um, you know, uh, having spent very little time in sport myself, um, but, but my two sons have spent a fair amount of time uh, in sport over their 20 years. And, uh, you know, just watching that development in those skills as you've outlined, I mean, there's still some work to do in some of them, uh, <laughs> says the mom. Michelle, you mentioned when you, you uh, provided a bit of an overview that you, you spoke about um, athletes that you're coaching now and, and athletes who want to be there. Um, have you ever had an opportunity where you were coaching an athlete who didn't want to be there, but was there for any other sort of reason or force in their lives? And if yes, what kind of challenges come with that with somebody who maybe doesn't necessarily want to be there, but is, and if that's even a, a regular occurrence? It's not a regular occur occurrence, but Una, you kind of segued into uh, the, the parents' role. And oftentimes, um, you know, parents are major influencers in, in their child's life. And 
they do sport because it's a family thing. It's a way to bond and connect families together. And it's a thing that they, you know, they go to the arena together. And I have had student athletes that have arrived on campus believing that this is what they wanted for their pathway for their next adventure. But then once they got here and they had independence from their family, realized that, you know what, I, I, I'm done and I'm ready to move on and I'm ready to have an independent journey and another activity and explore maybe other things that I didn't always have time to explore. So with that, it's not challenging. I think it's more about supporting and guiding the athlete and, and helping them understand what the next thing is for them and, and how you can support them. And if volleyball can still be a part of their life. Sometimes the segue is coaching. Sometimes they don't want to be an athlete anymore, but they'd love to be involved in the sport. So they'll continue coaching. And sometimes they just want to move on. So um, I think it's initially hard for the student athlete in that moment to, to make that realization and then to communicate that to family members or people or former coaches who have expectations of them. Um, but I, but at the end of the day, my message is always like your value and self-worth um, as a human being has nothing to do with your ability to perform in a sport. And, and sometimes those things get uh, mixed a little bit. So maybe a part B to that question, Michelle, is as a coach, how do you find that line of encouraging them that maybe stepping away from the sport is a right choice at that time versus encouraging them to stick it through because maybe it's just a, a little bump in the road? Yeah, and that happens in youth sport as well. And I guess what I say is when I'm recruiting, I always speak to the student athlete about they have to love this sport. They have to be so passionate and they have to, they have to remember that in the toughest of times, they need to be able to look through and see the sunshine because they they love this. And in your journey, there will never be, you're, you're never going to ride the highs of the highs all the time. Like there will be lows. And I guess what I look at or I always ask them to self-reflect is how long are you living in the lows? And if you're, if you're never coming back up, if there's not these moments that pull you back up, that excite you, that, you know, ignite your, your passion again, then that's probably when you need to start evaluating, you know, how long are you living in these lows? And, and is this something that I truly want to continue? Because discipline, uh, you know, sacrifice, all of the resilience, the resilient aspects of sport have to be worth it because you love it. You love being around the people. You love feeling the successful moments, but um, that it's a lot to give if you're not loving it. Thank you. James, as a, a person who has traveled around the globe a fair bit um, and, and fairly recently uh, decided that Canada is going to be, and Nova Scotia is going to be your home for at least the foreseeable future, um, how is it that you got involved in coaching in this community? What, what, you know, was it a tie to the community? I mean, you spoke about uh, being roped into your first coaching uh, experience. Is it something that you just naturally do now, or is it because you look for a tie to your community that you're in? There was a good mixture of it here. Um, obviously, working at the school presented a few opportunities, and that's how I landed in Lego Robotics and why I put that in my bio because so many of my experiences with coaching sports came to play in uh, a Lego Robotics team. Um, but I also started looking for the wider network. I think Mark said something about wanting to give back to the community. And I, as, as a philosophy, that is something that is very strong in my books. Um, and when, when I was in Thailand before here, I made connections with a school for Burmese refugees and my students would go and coach with them in different sports and different activities. Um, so here, going, I, going to coach my wife's soccer team, that sort of was an easy decision to go and make things fun for the over 30s league. Um, but uh, Yes, I'm always looking for new ways to reach out and basketball, soccer are my most natural ways, but if it's Lego robotics and public speaking, I will take that on too. Wonderful. Thank you, James. Mark, you mentioned um, in your in intro, um, you talked about 
giving back to the community, your community, as James has just referenced as well, and and you know having experiences where you were treated well, and and wanting to provide that experience for for others. Tell us about an experience that you had as an athlete being coached in your younger years. Something that really resonated with you that you thought, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna carry that forward. I think what always struck me as an athlete playing for adult coaches was just the amount of time that these people were taking away from their own families and other things they could be doing to spend with us. And I'm sure that, you know, I don't necessarily remember all of it, but we weren't always the easiest bunch to be around or the easiest bunch to coach, but yet they showed up week after week and imparted knowledge or the level of knowledge they could to us to give us a place to play, to teach us as best they could how to be successful at the game but also without even realizing it, we're teaching us those life skills that I've referenced uh, earlier. As you graduate through the levels and you become more sport specific and you wish to play at a higher, more competitive level, while the focus becomes very much about how to be the best athlete, best performer you can be in your sport, there's still all of these other lessons that are being taught you know, subliminally through the things you're learning, like the cooperation piece, like how to follow because you're the youngest player on the team and and you know you learn very quickly to be seen and not heard and to fall in line and do as you're supposed to do and then eventually over time you know through experience you start to 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 work your way up the ladder as other people move on or retire or you move to other programs where you become more senior then some of those lessons that you've learned through your other successful experiences and sometimes you know failures you now get to share with other people who aspire to be in the position you're in. And that, to me, is sort of how it continues to go, whether it was a coach, whether it was eventually a superintendent, whether it was a CEO. It was constantly wanting to learn from the people who are above my level. What do they do well? How do they do those things well? What makes them successful? How do I incorporate those things into my style of leadership or my style of coaching and make the journey as beneficial and and uh, as positive an experience as I can for for those that are in my charge. So, you know, I, I look at it in terms of constant self-growth, constantly looking at how you can better yourself and constantly looking at how you can take the things you've learned and apply those things to people that you work with, coach, to allow them to be better as well. Absolutely. I'm, I'm going to pause for a moment, uh, panelists, just to remind our viewers this evening that um, I encourage you, uh, please, to either raise your hand virtually. You can engage your camera and raise your hand in real time if you like. Um, and you can also write your questions in the chat function. Uh, we have had some questions submitted prior to, so I'm going to work through a few of those. Um, but before I do, I'm going to ask a question of all three of you. And that is to reflect on, on one of your most challenging moments as a coach. Um, and that could be a specific instance, or maybe it was a, a time in your careers. But something that sort of stands out as being one of your most challenging moments, and maybe even one of those moments where you thought, oh, it might be time to be done this. Uh, clearly, you got through it because you're all still actively coaching. Uh, so, uh, Michelle, I'll throw it over to you first. How about that? This is definitely not one of my most or the challenging most challenging moment, but it's because it's so recent that I will speak to it. Um, so I was asked to um, be a learning facilitator for the performance coach uh, le certification level for Volleyball Canada. And that happened this past month. And I just finished actually the in-person workshop. And I'm not certified to do this. I was going through my certification to make sure that I'm competent enough to be able to move forward and lead this on my own. So I had a co-facilitator. But for the past month, every Monday and Wednesday for three hours, online virtually for the first time, this curriculum was delivered. And I would run from individuals to you know my, my, my team practice and then into this three-hour workshop every Monday and Wednesday for the past month. And when I was asked to do this, um, you know, it, it made me one of the only female learning facilitators in the country for this level of certification. And the people that were a part of this workshop were all individuals who were trying to be certified for Canada Games and some were university coaches. So working on a peer to peer level and certifying these coaches who are very, very skilled and knowledgeable put me in a in a challenging position. 
And part of the course, and I see a lot of kinesiology students on this, um, but a part of the course content was doing a three hour biomechanical analysis of, you know, the volleyball actions and everything. And, and to do a three hour lecture on this was something I had to go back and refresh on my notes. And, um, but it put me in a, I was uncomfortable. I was extremely uncomfortable starting this process because I knew time was of the, I didn't have very much time to prepare. I knew how much I had to study in between. And, um, you know, my learning facilitator, co-learning facilitator, he would often do the sessions on Monday and I would have, you know, 24 hour, 38, you know, hours to turn around to be able to then reproduce the same lecture. And it challenged me, it made me grow, it made me feel uncomfortable, it uh, made me look at why I do things the way that I do in my gym and kind of revisit some of those very basic concepts. Well, actually, not all of these concepts were basic, but um, to be surrounded in, the, in that environment with these coaches who are asking challenging questions and to really think about why I do things the way that I do, it was hard and uncomfortable and challenging. But when I finished this past weekend, the in-person workshop at the Canada Game Center, it was extremely rewarding and worth the challenge and worth, you know, the difficultness over the past month. So I, I, I like putting myself in those situations. I like growing from those situations. I will always say yes, because I think we need that in our lives to continue to grow. Thank you for sharing. I'm, I'm hearing a combination of challenges within that one scenario that, that you shared, everything from time management to, like you said, your, your discomfort and, and being challenged, but that being a growing opportunity for you. And I think the takeaway message there is that we, no matter where age and stage we are in our lives, we continue to grow or continue to look for those opportunities. James, what about you? So the question made me think of one of my earliest big coaching lessons. And that was after three years of coaching the U14 girls basketball team. And there were a few girls on that team that had been in my team for three years and they were sort of the youngest and they came up and uh, became the oldest. And in that final season, um, we went to a tournament in Munich and leading up to it, the core of the team were doing extra running training sessions with me. We were getting up in the snow and early morning and arriving to school and training. They were really driven. And for some of them, it was their last year at that school. Uh, in the international school circuit, they move quite frequently. And they really wanted to go to this tournament in Munich and wipe the floor with their competition. They're so competitive at that age. Um, and I couldn't help but get caught up in their energy. In the semi-final, we ab absolutely thrashed a team that for the last couple of years had beaten us soundly. And the energy in these girls was so strong, so powerful, um, that when we went into the final, it crashed. It crashed after, a, after at about the halfway point. And um, we ended up losing, not by a lot, but we ended up losing. And they were so heartbroken by defeat. And I was heartbroken for them. So one of my first lessons was, as a coach, how do you face that? How do you put that front on, bring them back up from this, show them how hard they worked to get where they got to, even if they didn't win the final, and move on from there. Um, so that was, I, I say it was one of the hardest moments, but it's also one of my proudest moments as I realized that they worked so hard for it and they should be proud of what they achieved, even if they didn't get that final. Um, so, yeah, that was a big learning moment for me. You know, as an um, observer of games and, and um, you know, uh, tournaments, uh, as I said, I'm, I have very little experience as an athlete, but watching that and often wondering how that plays out, you know, you, you're watching the game and, and your team that you're rooting for is not doing well in the first half and you think, I wonder what's going on in the locker room right now, you know, and, and sort of really wanting to, to pick through those messages and wonder how, as a coach, you draw the right messages at the right time. So really appreciate that, James. Thank you. Mark, what about you? Well, I actually was going to talk about something different, but James really struck a chord when he talked about the, the team sort of peaking for the semifinal and then and then not having any gas left in the tank for the final. And it took me to this past summer where for the last two years, four years, but certainly the last two years, um, our focus was on winning an Olympic gold medal. That's all we talked about. 
that's everything we trained for. Um, from a planning perspective, we we focused on Japan and the United States, who are the teams who were ahead of us in the world standings. And so everything we did from you know from the day we qualified through to the last out in Tokyo was in pursuit of a gold medal. Um, we didn't talk bronze, we didn't talk silver, we talked gold. And the way the format was structured for the Olympics, which is different than it's ever been in past, the round robin standings, meaning how you finished after your your round robin games, determined the sequence in which you play for medals. So that meant that we knew two years ago that unless we beat the United States or Japan or both of them, we wouldn't be playing for a gold medal. And so we got to the Olympics and we won our first game and then we lost a very close game to the Americans, our second game. And then we won our third game and our fourth game was against Japan. And so we went into that game knowing that if we don't win this game, we can't play for a gold medal unless Japan beats the United States and then it gets into runs for and against and the formula gets complicated. But in essence, our, 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 our future our, it was in our own hands. And um, we lost a one nothing game in extra innings to Japan. And I remember after the last vote was made, you know, recognizing that everything that we had been pushing for for the last two years was gone in terms of a gold medal. And two of my veteran players, two of the leaders that had just been outstanding in their work ethic and their leadership were sitting in two different places on the bench, just bawling. And I remember thinking, okay, I need them to be ready to play in 48 hours for a bronze medal. And so I went over to each of them and I put my arm around them and I reminded them of all they had done for this team over the last two years to get us to this place. And that we would not have even been in this place were it not for the sacrifice they made, the leadership they'd shown, uh, the work ethic that they demonstrated, that they needed to be proud of what they'd accomplished, that we were the only team in the tournament that took either of those teams, you know, to extra innings, one nothing ball games. It was that close, the margin of error either way. And that they needed to, you know, we were gonna mourn it a little bit. And we talked about it openly as a team that we we all feel shitty about this. This is not the that this was not in the plan. It's not the the result we wanted. But at the end of the day, we had worked harder than anybody else at that tournament, and we were not going home without a medal. And then we went back to the village, and we talked about it again. And then the next day, luckily, we had a game against Italy, which was a bit of a game where we could get through the morning period, sort of to James's earlier point, crash a little bit, knowing full well that we were still going to be strong enough to win so that the day after that, we could have our minds fully on a bronze medal game against Mexico. And so, you know, when you talk about those difficult moments, you know, to, to continue to have to find the right things to say in the right moment while being true and authentic to what had happened, it was, for me to minimize our loss would have been pointless and it also would have been disrespectful to the effort they had put forward. But the acknowledgement of that we were all hurting over what had just happened but we still had a medal to play for and we needed to decide whether we were going to do what we needed to do to win that medal. And, and it does take a lot because as the leader, I felt even more gutted than they did because I felt it was my failure that I hadn't prepared them well enough to be able to win one of those two games. And so regardless of how they performed on the field, I felt that I had let them down. So trying to find it within myself to still give them what they needed from me to be able to reflect and to regroup and be ready to play was probably more challenging than I realized at the time. It just became something you naturally had to do as the leader. Um, but thank you, James, for, for using your example because it, it took me back to that. And um, it was a tough 48 hours, but uh, what a resilient group of women and they responded. And fortunately, we came home with a medal. So Mark, what do you do in a situation like that when when you need a, a pep talk, when you need a boost, like it, it, there's got to be moments when you think I've got nothing left in the tank and I gotta, I gotta really pull something out of somewhere right now and make this happen. What, what do you do for for yourself as a leader and a coach? Well, I mean, I've got a, a wonderful partner, as you well know, for the last 34 years that um, has always been my my biggest fan and has always been the person who's known what to say when I needed to hear it and to remind me of things that I've often forgotten. And, and so, you know, we, we talked twice a day for four and a half months while I was away. And so Anne certainly was living and dying each of these experiences with me. And so calling home and having the opportunity to talk through things and 
get her perspective on things as a former mm-hmm. Olympic athlete herself and a, and a you know varsity coach. It's been wonderful having somebody to bounce things off of who you know understands fully the experience you're dealing with and the stresses you're dealing with. But I also had a wonderful network. My coaching staff were a marvelous group of people and uh, people that I would be proud to call friends well outside of sport. And so we leaned on one another and we had honest conversations, difficult conversations, um, but we were very good at debriefing after every game. What did we do well? What do we need to do better? How was this athlete performing? Who's got the best rapport with that athlete? You know, to make sure that we were trying to get the best of everybody. But, you know, when I, 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 I spend a lot of time, I'm a, a self-reflector. I'm somebody that likes to sit and process things. And so being physically active, um, making sure that I have people to bounce things off of, and just recognizing that at the end of the day, as long as when you put your head on the pillow, you know that you have done everything in your power to give yourself and your team the best opportunity to succeed, it has to be enough. What a fantastic answer, Mark. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to segue quickly into a question that came specifically for you from one of our our participants on the line this evening. And the question is, what was your favorite part about Tokyo? Uh, The people. Um, That was my fifth trip to Japan. And I can't um, recommend more highly a place to go to see. Uh, The country is beautiful. But the people, the Japanese people are unique in in terms of how humble they are, how accommodating they are. Um, We were made to feel as though really we were at home in Japan. They came out and supported us um, the way they treated us in our pre-Olympic camp. We went to another city about four hours from Tokyo. Um, They rolled out the red carpet and it's not, it's genuine. They want the best for you. Um, Without question, the highlight of all of it for me was just the culture, the people, and the experience they ensured we had, even though it was a unique Olympic Games with COVID and and all that uh, we were dealing with, you didn't. I couldn't have felt safer than I did in Japan, despite all that was going on around us. Mm-hmm. Talk about an extra layer of challenge on top of everything else uh, around the pandemic and travel. So certainly appreciate that. We may have more questions that dig a little deeper into that, Mark. So another question that came from our from one of our many participants here this evening is what is the most memorable game or moment in your career? And you may have touched on it in your previous answers, but I'll I'll pose the question and see if you have a, a, a moment that you can think about that last point on the board, or it could be from years ago, it could be recent. But the question is, what is the most memorable game or moment in your career? And uh, Michelle, I'll go to you first. Some people may have heard me refer to this experience before because it still stands out as one of the most memorable experiences. I was at the 2015 uh, Fishu Games in South Korea, and at the time we were playing Zimbabwe. And the, the Zimbabwe team actually came from a university group. And when we were warming up on, on the court, we were doing a very structured, diligent warm up, very, you know, what some, some people would call high performance. And the Zimbabwe team, uh, we, you know, they, they had dance circles going on. They had celebratory actions going on prior to their match. And the, the score was a very easy 3-0 win for Canada. And the scores were probably, you know, 25-10 or less. And we were watching out for more of the safety of the athletes on the opposing side and, and also wondering about their well-being after, you know, having a loss or taking a loss to that level but it didn't matter. It was so much more than the volleyball experience for them. It was about them being there and being able to be with all these different cultures in this uh, different country. And they had people come down from the stands with their drums and uh, all of the families and guests came down and they created this big dance circle and they were just celebrating. And I think celebrating the fact that they were able to be there. And afterward, the coaches came up to us and asked if they could have um, like our video of some kind because they didn't travel with a video camera. They didn't have any way to look at video. And it wasn't about reviewing video for analysis. It was about being able to share it with the athletes and the families back home. So we were able to give them the video. But we we had a, a big photo. And I just remember that one of the coaches at the end of the tournament said that when this team was selected, it was because they had won their university championships and the winners received bed linens. 
And that's that was their prize for being successful for their university championship. So it was a real um, just eye opening experience and one that reminded us of like the, the beautiful part of sport and how it brings people together and the, the experiences that were afforded and the locations that we get to travel. So that was definitely one of my most memorable and still is the moment I speak about. Thank you. James or Mark? Um, so for me, the, the reward in coaching comes from the personal connections you can make and watching the personal growth. And while I was in Thailand, I worked with this one boy who was a phenomenal soccer player and you could tell he had a big future ahead of him and while ego is a very important part in athletics a part of that was causing him um a lot of conflict with the rest of his school soccer team so he played for an academy and he played for the school and in the school um his ability was definitely beyond that of his peers and there were problems with that. I had a text about a week ago from my friend who I coached with, who's still in Thailand. And he let me know that this kid is now the most humble but talented player he's seen. And he's now been, um, I think he's been taken to the Tottenham Hotspur Youth Academy in England uh, for the British Premier League. So to, hear, so to hear that the work that we were doing all those years ago, this was like one of the most memorable moments um, to know that it continued. James, I literally have goosebumps with you telling that story um, because I can only imagine in a lot of instances that that coaching can be a thankless job in many in many instances. I suspect. Um, so when you get to to hear a story about that and 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 know that the effort that you made so many years ago has developed or can, or helped an athlete develop, so it's wonderful that that was shared with you. Mark, what about you? Uh, I think the one that stands out the most is in 1998, I played my last year of senior men's fast pitch in Nova Scotia and the national championships were hosted in Nova Scotia and we won the national championships here with a homegrown group of athletes, which is unheard of for anywhere east of Ontario to compete uh, on that level. And um, to do it with a group of young men that I had recruited. Um, they were just into their teens. They were all just finishing up university. I was, you know, 12, 15 years older than most of them. But um, but to bring this group along and to mentor them and to take them to major North American events and give them a chance to learn what world-class softball looked like, and then to watch them at home with wives and parents and brothers and sisters and relatives there to see them reach the the height of the sport in the country here in Nova Scotia was was pretty humbling and also pretty gratifying and for me a nice way to finish a career so you know of all the things I've been so fortunate enough to experience that still sticks out to me you know Anne was there my dad was alive he was there our daughter Jazz was there it was it was pretty cool to have it go full circle for me with the people that mattered most of all to me there to see it I suspect that you all have many, many examples of that uh, of that question. So thank you for sharing those with us. Another question that was submitted is, on average, are coaches born or made? Who wants who wants to take a stab at that one with your opinion and or philosophy, whatever it is you want to share? Oh, come on! I'm not seeing a microphone come off yet. James, what about you? I. I was thinking about what I wanted to share in this event tonight, and uh, one of the things I came up with was, was uh, coaches make a community, and it's not just in sports. And I, I, I believe that there's a coach in everybody, uh, but maybe they just have to find what they coach. Um, introverts, extroverts. I've met so many different co coaches out there, and I've all seen success, whether that's with never robotics or sports or whatever. So I, I'm an optimist and I believe that there's a coach in everybody. They just need the right mentors and role models uh, to see it in themselves. Thanks, James. Michelle or Mark? Yeah, Una, I was, I was going to add to that it, just before James took his microphone off. Not 
not are they made or are they born or but but I think we're constantly evolving and I think I think we're often shaped by the people that are around us and that influence us and a lot of that time it's our student athletes or the athletes that we work with that help us evolve and help influence maybe how we look at situations so I think whether you're you're born or made I think it's a constant evolution and we're often shaped by the people that we're with Great answer. With both of those answers so far, I think a little bit about being a parent and how that is a little bit of a coach. There are times when I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to try to slip into coach mode here. Mark, what about you? Yeah. I think that those who have an aptitude towards leadership and, and are comfortable in, in stepping forward, and you see that in kids when games are come together and there's always the one that's ready to pick the teams and tell people where they're supposed to be. And I think I think you're born with that, and I think that's part of your personality, but I do think that you can also develop, as Michelle has alluded to, and James, you can develop these skills. Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, it's all about having a growth mindset, and it's all about wanting to learn and be curious and be better, and surrounding yourself with people. I mean, I often say to people, and I, I'm sincere when I say it, although they think I'm, I'm joking, is that, you know, when I'm the smartest person in the room, I'm in the wrong room. You know, I want to be where I can learn constantly from other people. And that can be younger or older. It doesn't matter. But it's about stretching and learning and being curious about things. And And I think some people have a more natural inclination to be that way than others. But I do think that it can be nurtured and fostered. And if you do have a passion to be good at something, um, then I think you can get there as long as you're willing to put in the work. Absolutely. Uh, to the participants on the line, we are we're nearing the end and we will end promptly at eight because I am respectful of everybody's time, uh, not just our panelists, especially our panelists, but everyone who decided to share their evening with us. So sort of a last opportunity if you have a question and that doesn't mean all 60 whatever of you can ask a question now, we won't have time. So in the meantime, uh, as I wait and see if there are any questions from the audience, here's one for you. And, and this may turn into a little bit of a debate. I don't know, but I'm going to drop it in here and see if there's any uh, any opinions extreme to one end or the other and whether or not you've had experience with this or not. But what are your thoughts on participation awards? As a parent, I'm really curious. Comments, quests, or comments or, or reactions? Yeah, I'll start. Um, so at, at nationals for volleyball, it's really interesting. There's a tiered system and nationals is an open championship. So you do not have to qualify to get to the national championships in club volleyball. And if you are in tier one, division one, and you win a gold medal, you get a gold medal, you have your presentation. If you are in tier four, division four, and you win that gold medal, you also, you know, you have a photo, you get to go to the stage. So when I think of part, you know, that in, in a sense is a little bit participatory in, in letting everyone be a part of it and not making it exclusive. But at the same time, I think there's certain aspects in youth sport that we want to encourage a place for everyone to play. And as Mark alluded to, that it, every child does have a right to participate in sport and to have this experience. And you know, there's tiered systems and, and things in place for a reason so that people can feel like they're, they belong, that they're able to develop, that they're able to compete at the level that they compete at. And, and those standards are often different. So, you know, I, I often have to explain or, or, or fight for that tiered system within Volleyball Canada, because I, I do think it's important that, especially at the 14U and 16U level, when we're not deciding who our national team is at that level just yet. And the, a lot of kids actually are late developing in volleyball, and it's important that they have that place to play so that they can continue to develop and experience that. But that's just a little take. Yeah. Thank you. James or Mark? I, um, I think it really depends on the event and the purpose of the event. Um, thinking about youth sports and if you're trying to get more students into a certain type of sport, children like to take things home. They like to show that they have something to show for the work. But I, in sport, I do believe recognizing a champion is also important too, whether that's a team or an individual, I think that's really important too. So knowing that you have to work for things in life is an important lesson. Um, so 
my answer for you, Una, is that it depends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks, James. <laughs> Mark, anything to add? I think there's a time and a place for it. I think that at the youngest of ages, when we're trying to encourage kids to be physically active for a lifetime and develop, you know, healthy lifestyle choices, it giving them medals to show up or, or giving them ribbons to show up and demonstrate that they were there and they were a part of something is important. But I also believe there's a point to which it should start to matter and that we should be keeping score. And that at the end of the day, the kids who work the hardest, who are the most motivated, should be should be rewarded for that. Um, because that is part of what competitive sport is all about. And they are quickly going to get to a place where when you're not good enough to be there, then somebody else is going to take your place. So I think that it's a balance. One of the things to, to Michelle's point that struck me about volleyball, because our daughter played at, at a very young level, was I thought it was very impressive that at the when the, at the U12 level, they got to play in a provincial championship. And regardless of how you performed, you still played as many games as everybody else and you still got a ribbon to go home. And I thought what a great way to keep kids motivated and interested because they simply want to be there and be around their friends. But I am a firm believer that you reach a stage and in my mind, it's that 14, 15 year old stage where you start to know the difference between good and great and you are making decisions around which you want to pursue. And I think when that starts to happen, it's important to have measuring sticks and standards that kids can aspire to because I think that's part of what brings greatness out in people. Wonderful, thank you. So folks, we're near the end. I'm gonna end off with a question for each of you, um, if I may, uh, and they'll be quite different. So Mark, I'm gonna start with you and your question is, what are you gonna do now that you're in retirement? Well, <laughs> I am, um... I, first and foremost, I want to take a little time just to catch my breath. I'm so used to being busy and I enjoy being busy so much that I quite honestly don't know how to relax. So I'm trying to learn a little bit about how to do that. Um, I want to get heavily involved in some motivational speaking and some uh, coach consulting. And I've got some opportunities to step into that world a little bit in the next few months. Uh, so that will hopefully quench the appetite to be involved in a competitive environment and help support. Uh, and of course, my work at Sport Nova Scotia as the director of sport gives me more than enough to keep me busy on the provincial level. So the motivational speaking, the coach consulting, um, we've got the Black and Indigenous Coach Mentorship Program, which I uh, began a year ago. That's in year two. And I'm certainly heavily involved in that and believe in that uh, very much so. So, you know, I'll find things to keep me busy, Una. Uh, no fear of that. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm kind of chuckling here as, as I listen to you because you started by saying, I'm going to take a break. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, <laughs> I'm thinking, yeah, what's that break going to look like? Yeah. So it sounds like you've got a, a lot on the go. And uh, yeah, and you've got, a, as you've already pointed out, a wonderful partner to share some of that relaxation time and that uh, that resume and moving forward or all of those opportunities moving forward. James, your questions come, your question rather comes from um, a participant who says, I have traveled to Barbados as well, and I wonder if you see a difference in the importance of sport in communities around the world. Um, absolutely. And my answer here would be anecdotal based on the small communities I've been within those wider communities. Um, in Barbados, I found um, a very competitive nature and sports and competition was a way to see the world way to get out there, be proud, represent the country and see the wider world through sports. Um, in Asia, in Thailand, I found a lot of the families that I worked directly with wanted their students to focus more on academics. Um, so the, those people I directly worked with, there were differences absolutely in the communities. Um, Personally, I think sport is important and I would love every child to have those opportunities. And that's what I think schools and clubs should provide is opportunities to try their hand at different sports and find something that they can be good at, but also great at. Wonderful. Thank you. And Michelle, your question. Uh, has to do with the varsity program and and how we last year um, 
took a year to not compete uh, due to our COVID situation and being in our pandemic, as as you all would all know, I think. Both my sons play in the varsity program and missed a year. As a varsity coach, how do you pick up from that uh, and move into this year with a sort of let's get ready to do this and, and uh, you know, sort of get past that year of, of very little to no competition? Yeah, Una, that could have easily been one of um, the challenging questions that I answered earlier in terms of how COVID impacted our team, but mostly the sadness that I felt for some of our graduating student athletes that didn't have an opportunity to really, you know, finish out the way that they had hoped. So our, our province in the Atlantic, we were very, very lucky to be able to train the entire year. We, we had very little stoppage in our training uh, last year. And some people would say, oh, that's unfortunate that you didn't get to play games, but the training held us together and it gave us, um, you know, community. It gave us a physical activity for you know, mental well-being as well. Like it, it gave us an outlet. And so while we didn't get to play games last year, um, we, we still got that fulfillment. And moving into this year, I think we've already had six exhibition matches, believe it or not. And uh, that feeling stepping on the court for the first time this year was really exhilarating, just all the emotion and reminding ourselves to be grateful for this whole year and not to take things for granted and thinking about our senior student athletes that didn't get a chance to play out that year last year. So we're just keeping that in perspective. Absolutely. And, and great, great words to end on perspective. Um, you know, that's, that's really what it's about in, in most of the context of this conversation. Um, we had plenty of viewers on this evening, so hopefully we touched on some of, uh, some of the information they were looking for. We got some questions asked of you that were submitted by our participants. So thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Thank you for the questions being submitted. Um, I certainly uh, heard many things and, and thought of many topics that I would have loved to dig a little deeper on, but as I say, wanted to be respectful of the hour that we've all allocated for this evening and especially of our panelists who shared your time, your experiences, your words of wisdom with us and, and we really do appreciate it. Um, winner of the draw prize, uh, Katie Menzies, if you're on the call, you were the winner of our draw prize. So we'll double check that you were in fact here and we're gonna send you out a little thank you for joining us this evening. As I said at the very beginning, it was wonderful to see so many students who uh, signed up to join us here this evening as well as well as our alumni from around the world. I believe we have somebody who dialed in from the Philippines. So there you go. There's a benefit to having a virtual event. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be able to uh, engage our, our alumni from around the world. So thank you again, everyone, for being here. Up next is our homecoming. Um, it's been looking a little different with almost every passing day. Uh, all of our varsity teams are at play at home over homecoming weekend. They are all being um, televised, so you don't have to come here in person. You can stay back and cheer, so to speak, uh, but we will have some events during homecoming weekend. Folks, please be safe. Uh, we hope to see some of you here during homecoming weekend, and we certainly hope that we see the other end of this pandemic sometime real soon. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you, James, for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.